Going Nowhere Episode 2 The Modern Cassandra How much do you trust the people around you? Do their words hold their weight? Or are they simply air with intention? We are a species so enamored with loyalty and truth that their themes have been explored through our storytelling for centuries. Stories as a whole are meant to reflect and soothe the human psyche. So why wouldn't our obsession with honesty and which side we fall on not bleed into our words? Take the Greek myth of Cassandra, for example. If you're unfamiliar, The Greek god Apollo grants a beautiful maiden named Cassandra the gift of prophecy. When she wouldn't sleep with him afterwards, he attached the caveat that no one would believe her prophecies, even though all of them would come to pass. Cassandra went on to predict the fall of Troy, the death of the warrior Agamemnon, but as Apollo had made clear, no one believed her. As these things came to pass and Troy fell, Cassandra attempted to leave, only to come to her own tragic end. An honest woman who could have helped them all, saddled with the heavy accusation of being a liar. There is exactly one park in nowhere, aside from the national forest in our backyard. It's next to the Brentwood Area Community College, with a perfect view of the graveyard on the other side of Sugar Creek. Strolling along that park, you may notice benches dotted amongst its greenery, each with its own commemorative plaque for one of Nowhere's prominent citizens. Most of them are just rich. But one, much newer than the rest, stands for a figure unjustly erased from the town's history. Her name is Mabel, the modern Cassandra. Our lack of records on Mabel's early life is supposedly due to the fact that she was originally from Georgia, before stumbling upon nowhere in April of 1864. However, I suspect that being a black woman traveling alone didn't help her get into any census records. As many excuses have been made by the Nowhere Historical Society over the years, those in Mabel's life simply didn't care enough to document in any detail her interactions with them. What we know about Mabel's life comes from her diary, which she began sometime in the autumn of 1864. The contents of that diary are strange at best and sinister at worst. See, as she got her footing in the Quaker-founded town of Nowhere, Mabel was able to secure a job working at the Nowhere Tribunal, as newspaper making had always fascinated her. The owner, Deacon Curvin, had just purchased a new Franklin Press, and was looking for easy, cheap help to operate it. Because he did barely pay her anything, by the way. From the few interactions she details in her diary, both Deacon and his wife's overall treatment of Mabel was paternalistic at best. While operating the press, Mabel writes that she often found herself zoning out while loading the plates, refilling the ink, and making copies of the paper for that day. At first, she wrote, something seemed to expand at the edge of her peripheries, like a pure darkness wholly and entirely nothing. This, taken by itself, could have been attributed to tunnel vision, caused by fatigue or heat exhaustion. But in the following excerpts, Mabel details these fugue states becoming more and more tangible. The diary excerpts you are about to hear were read by local actor Audrey Simmons and provided by Ellie Novak. All excerpts were transcribed under their watch at the Museum of Nowhere. Once again, my body and soul have become undone from themselves as if I was a length of rope with picked-apart fibers. 
I stand in this other world staring at a night sky that God has turned out the lights for. It feels like eternity that I stare at that nothingness before I can become aware of much else. I look down at my feet and see the darkness I have come to know try and form a ground of some kind. I wonder where I am and suddenly find myself back at the press. Papers in my hands which I have no memory of printing. Even more remarkable was that as these visions continued to occur, the darkness began to recreate the town of nowhere in painstaking detail. She described, best she could, the dirt roads and houses and natural features that, down to a blade of grass, were identical to the town she had begun to call home. At first, it was coincidental parallels. Mabel would mention how she had seen a particular type of flower freshly planted in the window box of a house. And then as she walked along the shadowed streets of the other nowhere, that same flower would have been planted in a matching shadow house. She detailed all of these small events every time they happened in her diary, giving us an extremely complete picture of this chronic phenomenon. All of them are remarkably similar to a column published in the Nowhere Tribunal around this time that credits the author as anonymous, but edited by Deacon's wife, Jory Curvin. Mabel had to have ghostwritten them. There's clear evidence in her diary, but not once is she credited as the author of these new revelations. This column goes on for about five years. Five years of short visions and predictions, all of them coming to pass. And, unfortunately for her, this other world, as she calls it, would not stay in her head for long. I fear that I am succumbing to a madness. Rather than stay in my odd dreams, those old friends have begun walking among the living. Now I fear more that if I say a word to Mrs. Curvin, she may impress to her husband that my actions are sinful or sickly, and I am not so dizzy aged to have such an ailment. I cannot afford to get the sack. Essentially, she details in this chapter of her life these waking nightmares as her visions of the place without stars bleed into real life. One such nightmare results in her seeing a boy about to be trampled by a horse, and she describes the shadows as parting like curtains to immediately reveal the scene in front of her. Despite herself, Mabel chose to save the boy but was not able to relish in her good deeds for long. The next year or so of her diary is choppy, obviously distressed, increasingly difficult to read. It is clear that at some point during this time she was outed, perhaps by Mrs. Curvin herself. The Nowhere Tribunal ceased its publications of her visions. Few people would sell to her, and even fewer would dare to look at her. I want to make it clear that they didn't treat her well before. She was single, younger, and the fact that she was not white and independent didn't settle well for a town of people technically considered progressive for their time. They othered her. Because at the heart of it, that is what people do to justify their prejudice. Us versus them protecting against what they considered an outside threat. <sighs> I believe from working with Ellie to piece together the fragments of her emotional state that she was afraid they would drive her out of town, from the only home she had known in a while, which made her final and longest entry for many years even more chilling. She didn't know it at the time, but Mabel would come to predict one of the most influential events in Nowhere's history, the Great Fire of 1872. 
It starts, as it always does, with the darkness that now seemed to become synonymous with reality for her, shifting and stirring and bringing her into the other world. But this time, some spark of light illuminates the darkness, and she thinks perhaps it is a sign of a heavenly blessing. But I see a terrible flame begin, and I fear I have fallen into hell. No matter where I move to help, there is an impossible expanding wall of that hellfire. A man with no face holds the heart of the fire in his cup palms. His shadow stretches unnaturally into the sky. I think he must be the devil. So swiftly I step back trying to find anyone else. But I do not see the curvins nor another soul. There has to be another near me besides that horrible man. Though I cannot see them, I know there are others. This thought is banished by the heat of the hellfire that burns, swirling around the hem of my skirt and petticoat. Still, where I stand, I am safe, and I hope that God will spare me. Would this be considered cowardice or wisdom, I can do no help. And in that place without stars, I saw nowhere burn. I wonder what I have done to deserve this fate. And hope my God will forgive me and spare my home this plot. This wasn't your fault, Mabel. In June of 1872, Nowhere's population was 436. After nearly everything in West Nowhere burned to the ground, that number changed to 106. 330 people died in a, dare I say, preventable tragedy. This vision, of course, was not published by the Nowhere Tribunal. In fact, they flat out refused to make an exception to print it, despite the validity of all the rest. Allegedly due to the fact that Jory found it too vulgar and blasphemous. This sent Mabel into a fainting spell that she was unable to recover from before the first flames began to spread across the dry August grass. Tragedy doesn't discriminate against the good, the bad. Tragedy just takes and takes, and only those privileged enough can outrun it. Tragedy took 330 people out of nowhere, but it was not an unavoidable tragedy that took the voice of an eloquent, intelligent young black woman. That was the disgusting beliefs of those around her, and the need for history to be written by those that it turned out fine for. The only things that weren't destroyed in the Great Fire of Nowhere was the stone foundations of the old military outpost that the Brentwood Area Community College would later be built upon, and everything on the east side of Sugar Creek. This included the House of the Mayor, the church, town hall, and the houses of all the affluent clergy and local government, which explains a lot about how the event is portrayed today. And if you weren't convinced that 1872 Nowhere didn't give a shit about this woman that could have saved them, we don't even have records of whether or not she died in the fire. She had stopped writing in her diary months before the event happened. I... I get mad about this because ever since I learned about her story, Mabel has become a sort of personal hero to me. She was a woman with not a lot, facing awful prejudice against her for her race, her gender, her perceived mental condition. Because obviously some god didn't give her the gift of sight. 
It, it could have been delirium or something that resulted in her odd fugue state hallucinations. Or, or maybe it was real. But we'll never know. And they'll continue to refuse to teach her story in school with the remarkable contents of her life just a story uttered by those who have to search for it. And she deserves so much more than a rusted park bench bearing her name. The bench wasn't even installed until some protesters in the early 2000s called out Town Hall for only having park benches dedicated to the rich real estate holders, and championed her as their pick. That's how I found out about her, actually. Just... Please try to visit her bench, listeners. Maybe leave a flower or two. It's appalling to me that someone can just be smudged out of history, her contributions glazed over by those who would rather forget than ever acknowledge them. But I am beginning to realize this may be a trend all too familiar. What we do know is the cause of the Great Fire was in no way supernatural or biblical. Matthew Grayson, younger brother of Nowhere's mayor at the time, Arthur Grayson, started the fire in his home. Although we do not know if this was accidental or arson. It is assumed that Matthew died in the fire. And that's, um, the sound of my power shutting off. Okay, um, it looks like I'll have to cut this one short, so, uh, stay curious, nowhere. Going Nowhere is a weekly mystery podcast produced by the Nowhere radio station. Make sure to subscribe to catch the next episode. Rate and review us on iTunes or leave us a like. Your support genuinely helps. Additional voices today were provided by Caitlin Pansia. Follow us on Twitter and Instagram at Nowhere underscore pod. Thank you. Have a wonderful day. Hi folks, AM here. I would just like to say that the response we got on the pilot episode of Going Nowhere has been amazing. A couple of things real quick before the start of this episode. One, a lot of the first few episodes were done in a recording session before we got a new social media handle, so you will hear me reference our social media as at nowhere underscore pod. In reality, it is now at the nowhere radio. And second, I didn't get to properly thank some people, so I would just like to make it known that the voice of Mara James in the last episode was played by Kylie Taylor, and the voice of Mabel in this episode was played by Caitlin Pansia. So, thank you both.